All right. And uh, it's such a privilege to have a chance to meet all of you here. And as usual, we are going to meet up like this every Sunday at 6 to 7 p.m. for Thai local time. And our topic today, it's so uh, interesting. It is how karma works. And we also provide you three languages translation in Chinese, in Burmese, and also in Thai. And I would love to take this opportunity to say hi and greet everyone from around the world. Please kindly let us know what's your name, where you're from. We would love to meet everyone here. Welcome, welcome everyone. I think I have seen a lot of familiar faces. Definitely first person, our guest speaker today. It is so special. Actually, our teaching monk, he's already with us. I think he's preparing and more than ready, you know, to have a wonderful session with all of us here. I would love to say hi with our friends from around the world. And uh, maybe let's start with in Asia. I have seen Jesse from Malaysia. Wow, nice. Nice to have you here. <laughs> ni hao, and ni hao, everyone. And also, Minglaba, I'm sure there are many people from Myanmar. <laughs> and uh, yes, I have got some of another friends as well from Malaysia. Yeah, Lin, hi. <laughs> Tan Kim, nice, nice to have you here. Miss Serena, mm -hmm. Go Siu, welcome, welcome, wow, wonderful. We still have time to, you know, say hi with all of us here in the chat box area. I'm sure that our friends, everyone would love to hear from you all, your name, your country, where you're from. We also have our friend from Cambodia, Miss Neri. Yeah, nice. And also we have got a lot of friends. That's wonderful. And Tony, yeah, Bonnie Chong, hi. Uh, Hong, hello, Kelly Yo. Yeah, wow, nice. And also, we have our friends from the Netherlands, Miss Isaria. <laughs> and uh, yeah, who else that we have got? That is so interesting and wonderful that we all are here. And you know, we we spend our time together. And of course, we, we are here for the good courts, for the good deeds to, you know, First of all, develop ourselves to be more and more and more serene and calm and peaceful during, you know, this challenging time. But we are here together in order to, you know, to spread our loving and kindness with our friend from other of the world. And once again, for our channel, we still have a lot of programs that we all can stay tuned and that not just only our global telling story. All right, so I would love to talk a little bit about our program today. And definitely we are going to meet our teaching monk. He's our venerable standard from the Netherlands. And we are going to have a chance to listen to the wisdom talk from him. And definitely we are going to have a chance to meditate together. And at the end of the session, we are all going to have a chance to have the Q&A session. If you have any question, would love to ask our teaching monk, you are all more than welcome to leave the question here. And please don't leave us so soon. Please stay together until the end. We are going to have the photo session as the historical moment together. So I would love to start with talking and introduce our beloved teaching monk today, our venerable Sander, he's, he was born and raised in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. He also graduated Master of Arts in Organizational Psychology. He has been practicing meditation since then, like since he still studied in the university. He joined, he started his journey with volunteering in the European Meditation Center during his university as well. After he finished his study, he's been working uh, as a full-time volunteer for the Dhammagaya Foundation in Thailand. 
he also started Thai since that time, and I have heard a lot about him. He can speak Thai and write in Thai fluently. So maybe we can namaskan and speak Thai with him for sure. <laughs> and also, um, in 2012, he also moved to the Magaya Center in Belgium. And in 2017, he's um, he has been in Wat Tamagaya, the Netherlands since then. So actually my family, my sister, my brother-in-law, they are in the Netherlands too. I have heard a lot about him from them. And uh, one of the interesting thing about the, um, the technique and you know how he loves to spread meditation and Buddhism in any country, any ways that he goes, he will have some of spatial techniques to apply the um, the wise story allegory in a fun and interesting way for you know not just only people in Asia but everyone will love the way that you know he tried to teach us Buddhism. All right, I think we are all more than welcome to meet our teaching monk. So in this moment, may. I invite our venerable standard to proceed and start our session, please. Um, good evening, everybody. I think most of you are located in Asia. So I will just say good evening. So a few of you are in Europe as well. And I will say good afternoon. <laughs> Don't know if anyone is uh, locked in from the United States. Uh, thank you for your uh, wonderful introduction. I hope I can live up to the high expectations. <laughs> um, so uh, I've never had a talk before, which is translated in so many languages. So uh, I'm not sure how this will go, but uh, let's uh, just try. <laughs> so um, it's very good to see that uh, many of you have uh, logged in from different locations and uh, Though this is just a new series, uh, I believe, uh, and a new um, initiative um, to start this common sea uh, uh, transmission program, but uh, still uh, many of you have already uh, um, have already joined. So this is a very good uh, good um, good omen, good uh, good sign that this is a very nice uh, program, and many people will benefit. So I just noticed from the uh, Facebook page that some or, of the other monks have already uh, been talking about karma. So I hope that I can uh, uh, improve the understanding. So first of all, may I pay my respects to the senior monks that have joined the presentation like Venerable Tanet and the other monks that have are more senior than me and they may I ask their permission to present the Dhamma today. And uh, I would like to start with the uh, guided meditation first, and uh, then I will, uh, uh, then we can dive into the topic of today. If uh, any of the translators have any questions, you can uh, send them through the chat. Uh, I hope I can spot that. And um, if you have any questions about the interpreting, maybe my English is not. Uh, native America, uh, I mean, uh, native English, like uh, American or UK English. <laughs> anyway, I'll try to make myself understood. So let's first start with a short guided meditation. <clears throat> So before we listen to the Dhamma of the Buddha, we can first spend some time to clear our mind, to cleanse and to clean it. Let us first breathe in deeply. And breathe out slowly. Then we allow the flow of relaxation to go 
through our entire body as though we just had a refreshing shower and we feel at ease our entire body relaxing. We can relax our eyes. And we can relax the rest of our face. We relax our neck and shoulders as well as our arms and hands. We relax our chest and abdomen. As well as our back and hips. And then we relax our legs and feet. There may be some part of our body which is still a little tense. We simply allow our body to relax step by step. We don't need to be fussy about it. Feel how your body is gradually becoming slower. And gradually more at ease. And we no longer feel concerned. <clears throat> with our body. Once we have been able to relax and let go of our body, we can fully devote ourselves to relaxing our mind. We allow our thoughts to just be we just let them be and we don't get involved. We don't resist, but we also don't get distracted by our thoughts. If we are distracted, then we simply go back without blaming ourselves, without analyzing, Simply sitting, being in the here and now. Even if we are a little peaceful, that is okay. We are happy and satisfied. Just being in the here and now. And we feel, we gradually feel more open and more spacious.
Once we feel at ease, we can follow our breath inside. We don't need to control our breath. We simply follow our breath and we notice where it goes. At the end of our inhalation, we can find the center space within, the center point within. This is a very important place to learn about. At the end of our in-breath, at the start of our out-breath, at the very core of our being. This is the center of who we are. We don't have to do a lot. We simply are aware of this nice, center within. As soon as we are distracted, we just give our mind a little nod. We just tell ourselves, remind ourselves where the center space is located. Some people are, some people like visuals. If you like visual, if you like images, you might want to imagine a Buddha sitting inside of you. Or maybe we can imagine a light, like the light of the sun or the light of the moon. Think of it as remembering something. We remember a nice sun shining at midday, or we remember a beautiful Buddha sitting inside. And we don't have to do much. It doesn't have to be a very clear memory. Usually our memories are not that clear. That's okay. We allow the memory to gradually become more clear. In the beginning, it may just be like a shade. At the end, it will become more and more clear. With a very soft and gentle awareness. Then we gradually come to the end of this short meditation. We become aware 
of our senses again. We notice the sounds around us. We notice the seat on which we are sitting. And we gradually open our eyes. And I will finish with a short blessing to mark the end of the meditation. Sapaputha nupavena, sapatama nupavena, sapasankha nupavena, satha soti pavantu te. So um, it's been nice to meditate a bit. just before we start. So uh, if the interpreters are ready, we can start the teaching of today. So there was one uh, very well-known uh, teacher who was very famous in the 50s in Thailand. And he once said that, um, whereas other religions put a God at the center of their religion, put uh, some higher intelligence at the center of their religion. In Buddhism, we believe that it's our own responsibility and we are our own refuge. And this is at the center of what we believe. And it is also at this core of this belief is that there is a saying like the law of karma. So I'm going to uh, give you the opportunity to ask any questions. Did you have any? Um, so I'm just gonna give you that opportunity. If you want to unmute, you can, but uh, if you have asked the question, then you can mute yourself again. And if you have a question in your own language, then you, we can ask the interpreter to translate the question. So let's dive into it. This is actually a talk that I gave as a part of a series of talks. And the entire series is quite long. So <laughs> today we just uh, do some part. Uh, before we talk about karma, you may be interested to know that there is a similar concept uh, or not maybe completely similar, but just somehow related concept in, um, uh, in, uh, in psychology. It's called moral reasoning. So there is some psychologists who are interested in why do we reason in a moral way or not. So some of you have, uh, are, don't really, uh, I'm not sure about the mute and unmute button yet. So I'm just going to mute you all for the moment. If you have any questions, you can, uh, you can ask them through the chat. I think that's easier for now. Okay, sorry about that. So uh, in psychology, they also recognize that it's very important to have a certain moral reasoning about the world, to understand the world and to have a good way of reasoning in a moral way. And there's four types of moral reasoning in, uh, in psychology, four component model of morality. Okay, this is a bit scholarly, okay? <laughs> but just want to give you the idea that uh, the idea of um, uh, moral, uh, having a moral and good perspective on the world is not just a religious thing. So in, in psychology, they also say that we can develop a moral sensitivity and understanding about the world around us, moral judgment, we can develop that and moral motivation and character, the courage to do good. 
this is very similar to what we call in Buddhism right view. Sorry. Uh, yeah. This is what we call right view in uh, Buddhism. Uh, in Pali language, for the interpreters, it's called samadhiti, samadhiti. Okay. And the four, the first four, we are more most interested today in the first four forms of right view. There is giving, there is sacrifice, there is offering, and there are fruits or results of good and bad actions. This is what we call right view. These are like principles to lead one's life happily. This is the way our deputy abbot in Thailand, our deputy abbot, abbot uh, Lompard Atativo, he explained. These are the principles to lead one's life happily. So just to make sure where we start in the right, uh, right understanding, this is a way of looking at the world. And uh, it doesn't, the Buddha doesn't say we, we have to believe this, but he says we should study about this because it will make us a better person. So first of all, when we study about the law of karma, it will help us to develop two things. In, uh, in, in Thai language, we call this uh, um, we call this Ragbun Globab. I have a, a whiteboard here. I'm going to write it for you. In Thai language, right? Ragbun. <laughs> Very easy for the translator today. <laughs> and then in, in, you, can, you can write it in English like this Globab. Maybe it's similar in other languages. It just means that, first of all, you love doing good. Or you're fond of doing good. Fond of doing good. Secondly, you dislike or you are afraid of doing evil doing wrong. These are the two concepts that are at the heart of right view, because when we develop, study about right view in Buddhism, we study about in order to understand, to, to feel more motivated about doing good and leading a positive and fulfilling life. This is the first thing. And secondly, we learn about right view, a good and moral perspective on the world in order that we are more careful, cautious, and more afraid of doing wrong. Okay, so this is the reason why we study about right view. So because fear in Buddhism is not always wrong, right? We have fear that is useless. I mean, if you are, some people are very much afraid of spiders. There is some noise here in the garden, but it's, it's gone now. <laughs> some people are very much afraid of spiders. This is not a useful fear. But if we are afraid of the consequences of our actions, we call this a useful fear. This is a good thing. This is what we might call caution. And there is the courage to do good. And if we talk about the courage to do good, which, which in Thai language is Rakbun, uh, to love doing good, then we start with faith, the quality of faith. Courage to do good comes from the quality of faith. And faith in Buddhism is not like you, uh, is, is, we use the word sata, sata in Pali language. And this is not faith like uh, what you, uh, like I was born as a Buddhist or something like that, or I was born as a Christian, or I was born like this, born like that. It's not faith as you, you are, what you have written in, when you, uh, when you registered in the population registry, 
it's not about what you say you are, it's about what you believe and what you strongly are convinced about, that everything we do, every good thing we do will come back to us. This is what we believe. So let's start about karma now, okay? I think many of you have already studied quite a little bit about Buddhism. So some of this may be old information, but you will be able to review, okay? First of all, so, so after we have understood that we study about karma in order to be more courageous about doing good and to be more cautious about doing wrong, then we study about karma in detail. First of all, karma will always ripen for the doer, not for anyone else. So this is an important principle. In some religions, uh, this is not such a clear concept, uh, but in Buddhism very clearly, whenever we do something good or whenever we do something wrong, we have to be responsible ourselves. The, the thing will always come back to us even if we do something and nobody sees it. For example, if you take good care of your mother in the last moments of her death, maybe very strong example, <laughs> uh, then nobody else sees this in the world, but only you and your mother, and then your mother dies. Even if nobody sees it in the world, nobody knows except for you and your mother who has died, that goodness will still come back to us. Every good thing will come back to us and every bad thing as well. So that is the first principle. Secondly, a karma will always ripen in kind. So you have similar karma. So for example, some people say that I want to know about Buddhism and I think Buddhism is very good. And they go to the temple and they give. Giving is a very important thing to do. And they believe that when they give, the fruits of that generosity will come back in their lives as people, other people will also give to them. This is a very, very important principle in karma, right? We give and people will also give to us. If we never give to others, then other people will also not give to us. This is like the principle. We attract things in kind, the same type. But it also holds for things like meditation. Uh, some people very much fond of Buddhism, but they don't spend much time on meditation or learning about the Dhamma. Just giving to the temple, very important, but not much time spent on meditation or learning about the Buddhist teaching. Then those people will develop certain good things in their lives, especially uh, they will find that their life becomes more prosperous. They will find, they will find wealth in their lives because when we give, other people will give to us. But at, this, at the same time, they may not have the clarity of mind, the wisdom and the understanding which comes with studying and meditating. So a karma will always ripen in kind. If we often gossip about other people, people will gossip about us. <laughs> If you have a coworker who comes to you to gossip about your other coworkers, that may be a nice, you may be interesting to join, you may be interested to join him or her. <laughs> but then remember that person, when they gossip about another person, a third person, certainly after they have left the room, they're going to gossip about you. Don't fool yourself. <laughs> so karma will always ripen in kind, every good or every bad karma, okay? A karma that has been done will ripen as soon as it obtains an opportunity. In Thai language, we call this, uh, in our temple, we call this chong. 
strong the, when a karma that is like has been done, it's like it's will wait and it will wait. It will wait to ripen. So that's why in Buddhism, we can compare our actions with planting a seed. We plant a seed in the, in the ground and then at a certain point it will ripen. And when we plant a certain seed, a certain tree will come out. You cannot expect an apple tree to come from the seed of a pear tree, right? So it will similar kind of karma will ripen. But it doesn't, of course, sometimes we, we hear the word, we hear the word instant karma, right? Instant karma. But that is usually not the case. We do not often see a karma ripen instantly. Okay. So there's some time lapse. There is some lapse. There's some time lapse. If you do some karma, it takes some time before it comes back to you. So sometimes this causes people to become impatient. <laughs> but what do we do if we have done, done a lot of good things in our life, but good things do not come to us? This is, this is because it takes some time. But if we want to make sure that good things will come to our, in our lives a little quicker, then we can do so by thinking about the good karma that we have done often. Not to compare ourselves with others or to be arrogant or something, no. But to be mindful of our good karma and for the mind to be joyful and clear. And then it's easy for the good karma to come back into our lives. The karma that has been done will ripen as soon as it obtains an opportunity also means that if we have, like we are in a difficult situation and we are with a lot of difficult people, bad people and bad situation, bad surroundings, bad environment is difficult for good karma to obtain an opportunity. If we have done a lot of bad things, if we are doing a lot of bad things, then the good things that we have done in the past cannot obtain an opportunity, cannot, cannot send its results, cannot ripen. So that's why it's important to realize that we also need to create the right kind of circumstances for the karma to ripen. So, if we have often think about the good things we have done and we try to, to find a good environment to live in, to find, to associate with people who are positive and, and, and realistic, then this good karma will ripen more quickly because the situation is better. So karma that, is, that has been done will ripen more quicker if the, if the circumstances are better, As, especially what we are thinking about. If we often think about goodness, then goodness will ripen more quickly in our lives. If we often think about negative and bad things and all the bad things that we have done that we are regretful about or something, even if we are regretful about those things, which is sometimes a good thing to have regret, right? then if we only think about those bad things, then those, then only bad things can come in our lives. So it's important to also think about the good things we have done, the constructive and creative good actions, the words we say, the thoughts we think, and the deeds we do. I haven't mentioned this, but I think most of you will already know this. Karma in Buddhism is always about three gates or three ways. Uh, our actions, our speech, and our thought. Everything we do in our lives goes through these three gates. Then the thing that comes next, a karma may not always ripen once. <laughs> if, even if we just give something to somebody who's not a monk or something or not an enlightened being or a Buddha, but just 
like giving to our parents or helping a neighbor. Even those things will ripen many times. They will come back in our lives many times. Or on a similar note, if we uh, fight with our family or fight with our coworkers, then that is also coming back in our lives. We are going to attract people who will fight with us again. So every karma we do will not always ripen once. Usually it will ripen more than once. But after karma has ripened a few times or many times at a certain point, every karma becomes exhausted. That means that there is an end. Even the worst karma that we do, there is an end to that karma at a certain point, but also a good karma. So if we do a lot of good in our lives and our lives are becoming better, we also have to remind ourselves that it must be replenished. Goodness we do must be maintained. Some people are born in very good circumstances, very wealthy people, good family, good education, a lot of good circumstances. But if we do not use those circumstances in the right way, and we, we do not treat others with respect, or we do not use our wealth to help other people or to support a good initiative, for example, support the temple or support a good other charity, then, then all the good things that we have in our lives, our education, our wealth, our family, all those good things, we might not have them in the next life. But this is how we look at karma in Buddhism. It's always about what not only is, it's not only about the present moment, but also how we, it's not only about the past, but it's also about how can we continue all the good things we have and we can gradually remove the bad things we have in our lives, the bad circumstances from our lives and transform them in good circumstances. So a karma must always ripen sooner or later. We can never flee from our karma. Actually, in the time of the Buddha, there was one, uh, one person from nobility, uh, from a high uh, class uh, of society. He was trying to flee from the bad karma he had done. But he tried in many ways to flee from his karma to protect himself so that no bad things would come to him. But eventually, he could not escape the bad things he had done. So this is uh, uh, something that is a reality. So in, in Buddhism, we do not believe we can destroy our bad karma normally under normal circumstances. But we can, what we can do is do good so that the bad karma that we have done in the past will not obtain an opportunity to ripen. It's just like you have a garden. If you have many beautiful flowers in your garden, many beautiful plants in your garden, then it's unlikely that there will be a lot of, uh, what do you call that, uh, bad plants in your garden. But if you don't have any plants in your garden, no, not have any flowers, then a lot of, uh, a lot of bad plants are coming in your, and will destroy your soil. So if you have a lot of good flowers, a lot of good deeds, good words, and good thoughts in your life, then it's difficult, much more difficult for bad karma to come into your life. It can still happen, but we will have it less. It's just like right now we have the COVID crisis, right? Some people, they are very hit, very seriously hit by the COVID crisis, but other people, not so much. It depends, depends on karma or it depends on circumstances uh, in the present moment, but it also always depends on karma as well. Yeah. So some people, they have never, done any done much bad karma in the past then they will they will not become ill
But we have to remind ourselves what the law of karma is not, okay? So I, I, sometimes I write karma with double M, sometimes I write karma with RM, it's the same word, okay? Karma is Pali language. Karma is Sanskrit language, it's the same word. So the law of karma, what karma is in our lives is like a law. It's like a law that just like we have a bio biological law, like we have a law of physics, law of aerodynamics, then there's also a law of karma. Everything we do comes back to us, whether it's our words, our deeds, our, our thoughts, comes back to us. And we have right deeds and we have wrong deeds. But there's also some misunderstanding. Some people misunderstand, even in Buddhist countries. First of all, the law of karma always gives some space for freedom to choose. We cannot just blame everything on our past karma, okay? So sometimes some things like, like right now, the COVID crisis, that's past karma, right? Everyone in the world has had some karma to be living in this present day and have this COVID crisis coming to our lives. Still, the way we respond to that past karma, that is our present karma. Another example, if you have a, a, if you have a burglar, right? who is coming to break into your house. At a certain point, they're going to choose the house. Which house are they going to break in? Which house are they going to commit burglary? And they might choose your house because you have some bad karma. Maybe in the past, we, we stole something from somebody and they will choose and they're going to commit burglary and break into your house which is a shocking and all that. But we have to remember as well, it will also be the new karma for the burglar. So there's always old karma and new karma meeting. It's our old karma that the burglar comes to our house, but it's the new karma of the burglar. Some people, some especially Westerners sometimes misunderstand, you know. One guy came to me and he said, uh, you are, at that time I was not a monk yet. He came to me and he said, you know, uh, I, I, I think you, you are Buddhist, right? I also believe in karma, he said to me. The other day I killed a mouse and it was his karma to be killed. <laughs> I think he misunderstands. <laughs> we, we cannot just use karma to justify, <laughs> you're like, it's the karma of the mouse, so we have to kill it. That's not the way it works. Uh, we all, okay, maybe it's the karma of that mouse, but it's your new karma if you're gonna kill the mouse. <laughs> Another thing, okay, I'm not criticizing any religions, okay? But I'm just saying that um, the law of karma is not blaming things on God's will. On a similar note, karma is not justice so if we see somebody who is poor okay maybe this is related to some bad karma they had done in the past or lack of good karma people who are poor in generally have not given much in the past but it doesn't make it right that people are poor it doesn't make it right that some people, for example, are handicapped, uh, are disabled. They are disabled, but maybe in the past they were a farmer and they didn't have a choice. They didn't have much of a choice. So they had to kill animals to survive as a farmer. So because of that reason, they are now disabled. It doesn't make it right. The law of karma is not the same as justice. They are two different things. Justice is what people create in the world or try to create by having a justice system, having police, having a judge and all that. But law of karma is like a law. It's not always helping us. 
for example, maybe uh, sometimes uh, we we don't have a, much of an intention uh, to do something bad, but we make mistakes. Even if we don't have an intention, the karma will still come back to us, but in less less strong. But you know, there's there's not always justice in karma. A lot of people don't know that what they are doing is wrong, but still the karma comes to them, comes to them. So karma and justice is two different things. God's will, karma, very different. Then it's also uh, blaming on destiny. There's nobody who has a destiny that is completely fixed. We can always change things. This is according to Buddhism. Okay, so this is not what karma is. I believe in karma, that means I can do bad things to people all day long and I assume they deserve it. <laughs> okay, this is the wrong example. Karma is always about us and what we do now in the present moment. And maybe sometimes it's the old karma of other people that something happens to them, but what we do will also come back in our lives. Finally, I would like to uh, end with a few notes about karma in science, but I think we run out of time. So let me just give you the opportunity to ask a few questions and maybe we can come back to this, can come back to this later. So I haven't mentioned, uh, I have mentioned a couple of examples of karma, uh, positive and negative. I hope you, find this clarifying. If you have any questions, now is the time to ask if you have any questions. I'm going to uh, allow you to ask any questions yourself. Okay, yeah. So uh, the question that is asked is, how do we know if something is past karma or present karma? This is a good question. So sometimes what I mean that some things are present karma, what some teachers mean by that is that sometimes the things we do are currently our choice. And there's, there's this element of choice. For example, there was a case study, a letter that somebody wrote to our abbot in Thailand the abbot of our temple in Thailand. And she asked, uh, she said that I, I moved to Japan to work there. And then when I moved to, the, to Japan, I had less opportunity to go to the temple because uh, in Japan at that time, there was no ma not many Buddhist temples uh, from the Thai tradition yet. So she said, she felt she had less opportunity to do good karma. So then she asked Lompa the Machayo or our abbot in Thailand, he says, she asked, uh, how uh, is this my bad karma that I went to Japan? And he said, no, it's your choice. You went to Japan. <laughs> you went to Japan. It's no, there's no karma in the past. You just went to Japan. It's your choice that you made. So sometimes uh, some karma is like the present moment. We choose certain things in the present moment. And because of that, we make a mistake. Some person, uh, he, um, like some person hurt themselves through some accident. And then they asked the, the, our abbot, is this a karma? And he said, no, you're just not careful. I mean, we can, we shouldn't exaggerate and saying that everything is karma. We also have the choice in the present moment and sometimes we just make mistakes. Sometimes we are ill because of karma. Sometimes we are just ill because we haven't been careful. We eat the, we eat the wrong food or we, we are not careful when we go into the cold, cold weather or something. That is our present mistakes. It's nothing to do with karma. Okay. Um, there's some more questions and there's also uh, 
the MC who wants to read some questions. It just goes to the questions in the chat first, if you don't mind. Um, so what kind of past karma do people have people done to suffer from COVID in this birth? Okay. So one thing that, uh, that may be um, a bad karma uh, is that um, in generally, I, I, I won't specifically talk about COVID, okay? But in generally, in Buddhism, we say that uh, illness can arise because we have hurt people or animals. This is the general rule of karma. And this is what the Buddha said himself in the Kama Ripanga Sutta. But um, he also said that if we refrain from hurting animals or people, then such karma will not come into our lives. Uh, or if we also ext extend that a little bit, if we, if we explain it a little bit more, you could also say that if we try to uh, improve uh, people's health and animals' health, then we also will not generally become ill so quickly because we have helped other people become more healthy. Uh, maybe different reasons, okay? This is just one example. But uh, generally, most illnesses come from hurting uh, other people uh, through our actions, mostly because of killing living beings, but uh, not always uh, uh, that reason. But in generally, it's mostly because of killing or hurting other living beings. Next question, can we accumulate karma from meditation? Yes, meditation is also good karma. First of all, we honor the Buddha because he was the one who discovered meditation as we practice it today. So uh, he, if we honor the Buddha, it's certainly a good karma, right? Uh, but um, uh, also the fact that we are training ourselves to have less negative emotions and unrealistic perceptions, what we call in Pali language, kilesa, if we have less kilesa, then we also, uh, uh, we are doing a good thing. So it's a good karma. Okay, next question. We have got some, uh, one more question before I leave, let the MC read the questions. Karma, can it contribute to lessons in your life? Yes, that's true. Our karma can sometimes teach us things, but karma doesn't have any intention, okay? We can draw some lessons from the karma, but the karma is not uh, some person on a cloud who's trying to teach us something. That is not, karma is just uh, like a, a law, law of physics, law of biology or something like that. It's just uh, the way uh, life works. We can draw some lessons from it, but that's because of our own wisdom is not because karma has the intention to teach us something. That is just a fairy tale. <laughs> okay, uh, just uh, may I ask uh, um, Ms. Angela Ann to uh, read the next questions. Yes, um, thank, by the way, thank you so much. First of all, I think we all would love to have a longer, longer session with, with you, definitely, Long Pi. And I'm sure that we are going to have more session with you in the future program, for sure. And once again, if anyone would love to leave any question here, please feel free to leave it in the chat box, or you also can still keep in touch with us um, in any, you know, channel, social media. So I think while we are waiting for more questions, um, I think we have got a few things here. Longki Sander from okay. Maduri. Right. Oh, a question from India. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, Venerable monk, you mentioned about farmers because of the karma of killing animals will get a birth of being a handicapped person. But the farmers are growing food for everyone. Do they not get the fruits of this good deed? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So everything we do has a result. I was, exam I was mentioning the example of farmers who kill animals for their profession, but I should 
add that I was giving the example of a farmer in the past, in the past, in the present moment, we have much more choice uh, what kind of farming we do. So we can make more choices and we can be more kind to animals. For example, right now in Holland, uh, there was just a new law that was issued uh, prohibiting, uh, uh, as well as in Germany, prohibiting uh, the killing of little, uh, what do you call it, little chicks um, in mass. So uh, farmers are no longer doing that. So in generally, we cannot say the profession of a farmer is wrong. Okay, that was my point. But just saying that some that there are many professions in life, which have uh, which is difficult to avoid doing things wrong. There are many professions like that. That's why the Buddha said that there is some life uh, in the many, um, the life of a householder or the life of somebody living in society who has not withdrawn from society like a monk or a nun. He said it's filled with dust. Uh, it's a path of dust. There's always some things that 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 might you know might might go wrong. Even if you do a profession which is usually associated with doing good, like being a doctor, you can make mistakes. You know, as a doctor, you can accidentally kill somebody or maybe make the wrong choice and then kill somebody, which is maybe sometimes a bad karma if you have a wrong intention. So. Sometimes it's, it's important that we choose the right profession, but also within every profession, there is also choices we can make to prevent from doing bad karma. Uh, like in, in some people I say, if you have, if you're running a bar, right? If you're running a bar or a cafe, but then in Holland, in, in close, to the city close to the place where we are here there's a city in which there is a non-alcoholic bar non-alcoholic cafe there is I, I i was surprised but there are apparently non-alcoholic cafes it's a very old tradition but so so when you hear about this you can say there's always a choice you know people can always make choices okay next uh, question um, shall i read it myself it may be easier. Uh, I, I may help you, Longhi. Okay. So from QIL, um, what if our gamma guide starts to do wrong? How do we stop from following our gamma to do wrong? Yeah. So there may be different reasons. Uh, no, you cannot. Um, so there's always, uh, you always um, so there's also some doubt whether uh, he or she should ask that question. I think asking a question in generally is 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 a good thing. Okay, <laughs> so there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, um, so may I just return, go back to the presentation for a moment. There is actually um, um, something there that is important. Uh, let me just go back for a moment. So you can say you can see there there if we want to do good in life there are four thing, five things that will help us to be more courageous to do good according to the Buddha and this will help us to be to stick to our principles. First of all, we should have faith that all the good things we do come back to us. And remember, if you do have a good friend, a good mentor, somebody in your life who can encourage you to do good, which we call in Pali language, Kalyanamita. Kalyanamita, a good spiritual friend. If you have somebody like that, it's easier to develop faith and courage to do good and to avoid wrong. Okay. Secondly, of course, if you often live ethically, you live in a good way, you have moral precepts, then it will easier will be easier and easier to keep them if you build up that habit. So there's also a few other examples being learned and have uh, the habit of being somebody who always puts in a lot of effort in doing good and wisdom. 
But these are some examples of qualities we can develop to make sure we are not straying from the path. But in generally, uh, I don't know your specific situation, uh, Miss or Mr. QL, QL. <laughs> uh, but um, sometimes uh, a very good thing to start, first of all, is having a good friend who can help and encourage us to avoid wrong and do good. And if you want to break, have a clean break, for example, you used to drink alcohol, you don't want to drink anymore, get rid of all traces. Get rid of all the bottles <laughs> and get rid of all your friends who are reminding you of alcoholism. So this is some example, okay? This may not be the, the thing that you ask about, but I'm just giving you an example. Okay. Yeah, all right, thank you. Thank you once again. Thank you so much, Long P and John Kuel, right, Long P? <laughs> oh, <very good. laughs> Uh, too and uh, yeah I think that this is something that all the people in in the world really you know like would love to listen and study and dive in the law of gamma more and uh, anywhere I have heard or have met any foreigners not just only Asian or Thai people they also would love to learn more and know more about this and I'm sure that a lot of people and everyone will have clearer uh, picture and explanation about this and yeah so and in this occasion I would love to be the representative to thank our venerable sender once again for giving us such a wonderful session and uh, we hope to have you with us once again for the future program so in this moment may I invite everyone to turn on your camera your video, we are going to have the photo session together. Yes, this is wonderful moment that we develop ourselves with the meditation and also learning um, Buddhism wisdom together. So I would love to invite everyone to getting ready. Yeah, we are going to have the photo session together. Please make sure that you turn on your camera, your video. All right, I may count down a little bit and please smile from the center of your body with your inner peace inside. Maybe we start with the lotus pose. <laughs> Why position, showing respect to our beloved teaching monks together. Smile, I'm going to count down a little bit. Five. Four, smile please everyone, three, two, and one. May I also have another pose? Come on, everyone hurry up. Maybe two thumbs up for, for yourself, you know, that we all spend time together. Come on, everyone, you still have chance. <laughs> two thumbs up for everyone. Once again, five four, three, two, and one. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. And uh, yeah, so I think uh, this is the wrap for today. So once again, Long P, is there any special or last message that you would love to, to tell everyone before we dismiss our session? Um, yes, uh, so I'd like uh, everyone to be remind yourself that every deed we do, everything we do matters. So that is both good and both the good things we do and the wrong things we do. So I would like to give a blessing to everybody that by the good karma of all the good things you've done today and listening to this good to this uh, teaching that I hope has been helpful. May you find happiness and joy in your life. May you find wisdom and wealth and good health for everybody. May all in every lifetime, may you find wise people on your path and every lifetime until Nirvana. 
Satu. Satu. We really appreciate your blessing and also wisdom talk that you, mm. you know, mm. like step up mm. another level for our love gamma. Thank you, Long P. Dunquel, <laughs> once again. All right, everyone. It's kind of really, you know, time so fly so fast. Uh, we wish to have more and longer, you know, session together. It's been a pleasure to host you every day. I wish you all, you know, have a wonderful and a pleasant day. And I would like to take this opportunity to inform all of you that we still organize our wonderful program, Global Storytelling, every Sunday at 6 to 7 p.m. for Thai local time like this every Sunday. And also, please do keep connecting with us with Come and See channel. Please like our Facebook page and also subscribe YouTube channel for Come and See channel. And also we have a lot of and plenty of interesting programs 24 seven hours in our Google Drive. If you may have a look and also the QR code link for the all programs in the Google Drive that in the chat box, you may see both the QR code, Google Drive, all you know, the pro programs that you all can join in the chat box. So rejoice in everyone's merit. Please take care and we hope to have you and see you again next time. Thank you so much, everyone. See you.